So I would like to thank the organizers, uh, Christian Micheletti and uh, Enzo Arlandini. Enzo, I never told you, but um, I have a small, uh, just a two-minute talk, uh, story to tell you. So Enzo Arlandini was a postdoc in our lab for many years, and uh, we wrote a paper together. So it was Garel Orlan Orlandini. And one day, I received a phone call from a good friend of mine that uh, some of you may know, Bill Eaton. And he told me, what is this paper? Is it a joke? <laughs> OK, so it was not a joke. So anyway, thanks for inviting me. Uh, so I will talk about uh, my talk is a little bit related to the talk we heard just be before by Marielle, except that it's a physical point of view from uh, some problems which are very related which are the problem of knotting and knotting in polymers, but I'm pretty sure it can be generalized to the kind of problem that you have been uh, talking about. So in the first part of my talk, I will talk about knotting and knotting of polymers using Langevin bridges, which is a technique that will, I will explain. And then in the second part, if I have time, I never know if I am enough or too much, I will talk about knots in DNA, and in RNA, sorry. Knots in DNA, you know everything about it, but knots in RNA is a different subject. And if I don't have time, and even if I have time, I will speak very briefly about it. I strongly recommend you to go to see the poster by Marco Di Stefano, who is a co-author of this work. So about uh, DNAs, we know that there is a lot of uh, coiling and super coiling, under coiling and, uh, in DNA. And there are many knots in DNA, and so oh, I don't see. OK. And uh, you have seen these pictures hundreds of times, but I cannot resist to show it. So these knots uh, are present. Sometimes they are functional. But sometimes this uh, supercoiling or undercoiling or knots have to be disentangled. And for that matter, there is uh, in the, the cell will produce an enzyme, which is topoisomerase 1 or 2 which can re relax the torsion or unknot DNA. So these are, OK. This is for people who don't know what are knots. I guess in this audience there are none. Uh, and the topo 1, so the, the, there are two types of topo isomerase. The topo 1, which doesn't use ATP, which cuts only, I, I, which cuts only one piece at a time and then relaxes the torsion around one strand, and then reconnects. And topo 2, which uses ATP, and cuts both strands and reconnects. So the questions that, uh, that have been uh, touched upon before, and that I will uh, try to answer, or give a method to, to answer, is how does DNA knot and unknot? What are the set of moves to go from one knotted structure to another? And the approach that I will describe is based, on, is based on dynamics. So it's really a physical approach. It's not a mathematical approach where you look for minimal set of, uh, of uh, moves which will disentangle. It's really based on Langevin dynamics, which is uh, what people believe to be the diffusive dynamics occurring uh, for polymers. And the question is, how does a polymer go from one initial given configuration to a final conformation? So you have one initial conformation, which is, a, let's say, a certain knot, a final conformation, which is another kind of knot, and you ask, what are the stochastic paths which are going from one to another? It's really the path which are generated by a Langevin equation, but you want to generate this path unbiased. The only thing you want to, so in general, if you start with an initial conformation, you will sample everything. And the, of course, the, the target that you're looking for is of zero measure. So you have to, it's very improbable cases. So the question is, can you bias your dynamics, your Langevin dynamics, in a way that you will converge always to the correct final state, but without biasing the statistics? In other words, you, you generate the real path. And to do that, uh, the standard, well, not the standard method, but the method is uh, Langevin bridges. 
And to illustrate this method, I will, uh, I will illustrate it on a single particle in one dimension, just because the equations are simple to put up. And then I will, uh, I will uh, generalize it for a polymer. So, uh, and this work was published uh, first in 2011 and then uh, with uh, Satya Majumdar on several cases. So, the question is the following. So, this method uh, originally was not uh, developed to study knotting of DNA or RNA, but rather to study uh, barrier crossing in proteins. And, uh, of course, when you have barrier crossing, it's... Uh, events which are exponentially rare because you have to cross a barrier, so you have this Kramer's time which is exponentially large, and the, the time fluctuations of the system, the system fluctuates between this minimum, then suddenly goes there, and the, etc. and these events of crossing barrier are exponentially rare, and it's very difficult to observe numerically when you do protein simulations, so the method was developed in order to try, and the interesting physics, of course, is in this region, in the transition region, because this is just harmonic oscillations in, in the bottom of the two wells. So the method was developed then, and what I will show you is an adaptation of this method to the case of uh, polymers. So the starting point is the overdamped Langevin dynamics. So you take a Brownian Langevin dynamics, so it's a particle who is uh, moving in a potential U of X, and gamma is a friction coefficient, and you have a Gaussian white noise, which is uncorrelated, so the expectation value of this noise is zero, and the correlation function of the noise is, is a delta function. So, of course, this is a, what mathematicians call Ito process. I write it in the physics way, in mathematics, they would write uh, dx equals uh, f dt plus dbt, right? But uh, I understand it better like this. And the friction coefficient is related to the diffusion coefficient by the so-called Einstein relation. So usually what one does is one would... Uh, so, of course, in the case of a polymer, as we will see, you discretize your polymer or you, you consider a set of beads and you don't have only one coordinate, but you have n coordinates which correspond to the n different monomers of the system. And then you discretize the time. So there are many ways to discretize the time. There is this uh, Ito versus Stratanovich, doesn't matter. I will not dig into the details, but you, you can solve this equation. And in fact, from this equation, you can write a path integral representation. And one way <clears throat> that people have been using and which was mentioned this morning to do the sampling between the two points is the so-called transition path sampling. So one way to, to visualize it is on the path integral representation of the, of the Langevin uh, equation. This Langevin equation, you can write, by using the equation, you can write what is the probability of a given path x1, x2, xn in time, and uh, the probability of having a given path x1, x2, xn is just the product of the probabilities of the noise eta, and therefore you can write the probability to start at xi at time zero and n at xf at time tf as an exponential with this kind of uh, action. And uh, from this action, uh, it's exactly what was mentioned this morning. So there are many ways to do transition path sampling. Uh, essentially what you do is you start with an initial trajectory with fixed endpoints x, i, x, f, and then you move all the x's in the middle by a certain delta x, and then this will, the, if you move one of the x, this will imply a certain variation of your exponent here, and then you accept or reject this deformation with a metropolis kind of algorithm. So the difficulties of this method is that the sampling space is huge because you have all the discretization in time, plus if you have more than one degree of freedom, you have many, many degrees of freedom. And as a result, it if you have barriers in your system, it depends very much on the initial trajectory. So instead of that, I used something which, is, which I call Langevin bridges. Uh, which was in fact introduced by 
uh, mathematician, uh, Daub, who is a famous American probabilist. So the idea is the following. If you consider all paths of a single particle which start at, at x0 at time 0 and which end at xf at time tf. So I consider all the paths which are joining the extremities like this. And now I ask, among all these paths, what is the probability to find a particle at point x at time t? So the conditional probability for such a path to go through x at time t, it's given by this curly p, which is just the product that the particle starts at x0 at time 0 and goes at x at time t, times the product that the particle at x time t will end up at xf at time tf. That's just the Markovian property of the probability uh, for this path, and properly normalized, of course. Now, this p of x and t, so which is just the forward probability, this is the backward probability. Uh, this one satisfies the Fokker-Planck equation because uh, it's a stochastic motion, Langevin. So this one satisfies the, the, the Fokker-Planck equation. This one satisfies the adjoint Fokker-Planck equation, which is the reverse Fokker-Planck equation. And so P satisfies the Fokker-Planck equation, which is here. So d dx, and the, the current is just dp dx plus beta du dx times p. Beta is the inverse temperature, of course. And the adjoint or reverse Fokker-Planck is dq dt equals minus d d2 square q dx squared plus db du dx dq dx, <clears throat> which you can obtain by just uh, taking the adjoint of the first equation. Now, if you remember, the conditional probability is this curly p, which is q times p. So now you write d curly p by dt, and you, you use the multiplication rule for derivatives, and you get this exact equation. And this exact equation, so it's dp dx plus d dx beta u minus 2 log q times p. So this is exact, it's just a trivial manipulation. And this exact equation shows you that the curly p, the conditional probability, satisfies a Fokker-Planck equation absolutely identical to this one, except that there is an additional potential here in beta u, which is this 2 log q, where q, again, is the probability to go from xt to xftf. So, that's the only difference. And this term is, of course, the term which is conditioning your particle to, to be that to end up at xf at time tf. So now, if you remember that the Fokker-Planck equation, as written like this, is derived from a Langevin equation in the potential u, then this equation, where the potential is beta u minus 2 log q, is therefore derived from a Langevin equation where the potential is beta u minus 2 log q. Right, this is the new potential. And q, so in other words, you have this Langevin equation. It's a conditioned equation, condition, or I don't know how to call it. If you start a particle, so q is p of xf, tf, xt, if your particle starts at x0 at time 0 and you solve, you iterate this equation, it will end up at xf at time tf with the exact probability without any bias. It's just like if you erase all the paths which don't go to the target, but you have exactly the right statistics in your path. Okay, so, and uh, I wrote Girtanov because when you Okay, when you talk to mathematicians and they tell you, oh, but this is absolutely trivial, it's a consequence of Girzanov theorem. Okay, so I'm sure some people know what is Girzanov theorem. Okay, anyway, this equation is exact. The equation is Markovian, but it depends through this function Q on all the future of the trajectory, but it's a function of X and T, so it's a Markovian equation. And it doesn't bias the statistics of the trajectory. 
So some example, some trivial examples before going to polymers. So if you take a single particle, a Brownian particle, and you ask what are the trajectories of a particle to start at a given point x0 at time 0 and xf at time tf, then the function q is just the Green's function of the free particle. So you solve it exactly, and if you plug it into the equation, the condition Langevin equation the, for Brownian motion is just this equation. So you see that this equation, which is exact, you can solve it very trivially. When T goes to TF, so this is like a spring, a time-dependent spring, and the, the, how do you say, the strength of the springs diverges when T goes to TF, so the particle is driven to X equals XF, whatever you do. And you can solve it, of course, uh, trivially, and uh, it, it takes no time. This is a sample of 1,000 trajectories starting at minus 1 and ending at plus 1, and it, it takes a fraction of seconds to generate all these. Another example is the so-called Brownian excursions. So Brownian excursions, if you, it's the same. You, you go from, so you have a plane, uh, And uh, you're not, your trajectories, so it's just to illustrate the method, you, have, you start here and you look at paths which will end here and which, don't, which are not allowed to go into the lower half plane. So uh, the Green's function then you get by mirror image, by, by, by subtraction of a mirror image, and this is what you have here. And so the equation that you get is here, and when you take, if the final point is on the wall, you get this equation. I mean, you can play all kinds of games, and again, you can get trajectories which are extremely easy to generate and to obtain. Final example that I want to show because it's the most relevant to, to polymers is the case of uh, einstein uhlenbeck process, which is the case when you have the potential is a quadratic uh, harmonic potential. Then the bridge equation, you can show that it, it takes this form with a Cauch K over gamma, where K is the rigidity of the, of the harmonic potential, like this. And an interesting fact is that this equation doesn't depend on the sign of, the, of K, which means that the conditional path in a potential is the same as the conditional path in the opposite one. And this brings to the apparent paradox, but it's not, it's a, it's a fact of life, that for instance, the time for a particle to go from here to here is exactly the same as for the particle to go from here to here. Okay, so now, uh, and for low dimensional systems, you can, uh, you can calculate things exactly by, by uh, looking at the eigenstates of, a, of the Fokker-Planck equation, and you can get things exactly. So I will continue now, and I go back to polymers now. Now assume that we are in excess of topoisomerase. So the chains can be modeled as a Gaussian phantom chains. So the chains, I assume that the chains can cross each other. There is no resistance because you have Whenever they get in contact, some topoisomerase will be around and will allow the crossing of the chains. So the model I will take for the, for the phantom chain is a Gaussian chain. So, so I take a, a, a discrete model, but it can be a continuous model, and then it would be some integral dr, ds, square, etc. But for the, for the drawings and everything, I use, a, I use discrete chains. So this is just the elastic bonds which are making up the chains. And then we know that DNA has some uh, bending rigidity. And so I use a model of chain which is a semi-flexible chain where for the bending rigidity I take the square of the, the square of the second derivative of R. Of course, this is not exact, but it's a way to introduce in the system the, the bending rigidity. So this coefficient k is related to the bending rigidity, and this is the kun a is the kun length. And I look for a circular chain, which means that rn plus 1 equals rn, and r0 equals rn. 
And then the normal, the standard dynamics that you expect for such a chain is the so-called Langevin. So in that case, it's called langevin rouse dynamics, which I write here. DRN dt equals D, so then it's the D minus D beta H by DRN. So it's the force, which is uh, the gradient or the derivative of beta H with respect to N. So it is this term. This term comes from the elastic energy. This term comes from the bending rigidity plus Gauche plus random noise. So this will produce the diffusion of the system, but of course, if you start from a given knotted configuration, there is no chance that you will ever reach any interesting configuration that you're interested in in any finite time. So then, so we assume that we have a certain configuration Rn0. So Rn now, N is a set of the N monomers. So we have a certain configuration at time zero. The final chain is RNF at time TF. And then, the, so as I said in the one-dimensional case, the bridge equation is just the standard Langevin equation where you add this term. And this term, this additional conditioning force, is just 2D <coughs> times the derivative of log Q, where Q is this uh, probability that given the particle at Rn, the configuration Rn at time t, it will be in the final state Rnf, which is the state that your, your target state, at time tf. And of course, what I forgot to say is that this can be easily generalized if you add an external force and for linear chains, which are not closed. Just uh, for this uh, Example, we, I do it without external. So adding an external force, you would have just have an additional Fn. And uh, linear means that you don't have periodic boundary conditions. So everything can be calculated exactly. This function Q, in the case of a, of a Gaussian chain for the model that I proposed here, this can be exactly calculated. And then you can solve everything in Fourier space. So you go to Fourier component, rho p. Uh, the Hamiltonian takes this form with one minus cosine omega p. And this is the bending, the, this is the elasticity, this is the bending rigidity term. And the equation, the bridge equation in Fourier components for the chain reads this form. And this is very similar to this ollenstein uhlenbeck process I was telling you about before. And this is the Langevin bridge equation, which is exact for the specific model I am talking about. And this omega, which appears here, is the sum of these, uh, of these two terms. So of course, this one goes like omega squared. This one goes like omega to the four, and that's the <coughs> Elasticity term goes like okay. Elasticity term goes like omega square, and uh, this one goes like omega four. So the idea is that you solve now this equation in Fourier space, so with these Fourier modes rho tilde n, and then if you want to see what's happening in real space, you just uh, trans Fourier transform back to real space. And of course, you, you don't have to do it at every time step. You can, so in fact, the most time consuming, uh, when you solve this equation, it's extremely simple to solve. You can take, uh, you can solve it uh, f up to sizes 400, I think, uh, easily. Um, and uh, probably even more if you use a sophisticated computer. The only time consuming part is when you do Fourier transform inverse to real space. And I'm sure that you can make it fast by using FFT, which I don't uh, know really how to do. But uh, anyway, so there is one difficulty which I didn't mention, uh, which is that the final configuration. So in the f in the form I did, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the monomers of the original configuration. So if this is uh, one, two, three, uh, let's say n, there is a one-to-one, -one, I use the one-to-one -one correspondence 
between, so like this, right? Because I give the initial configuration, the final configuration. But in fact, if you look at the knotting or unknotting, what you should allow is for a circular permutation of the indices. So your chain, you can map the final state can be any circular permutation of the final configuration that you give. Because, uh, right? Because there is no specific assignment. Uh, it's just the knotting that is interesting. It's not really the conformation of the chain. It's the fact that the final chain will be knotted or not. So it can be done because the final state can be anything you want. The final conformation is therefore a superposition of all circular permutation. And one can again write an exact bridge equation and solve them numerically. So I show you um, what, so of course uh, this is, so I believe there is not really very well defined path in the knotting or unknotting of chains because it's a purely diffusive model. There is no real energy involved, except of course uh, the bending rigidity that you don't want to mess too much about. And um, so what you're supposed to do to, in this game is you're supposed to start with many initial conditions. And for each initial condition, you're supposed to do many runs with different noise histories. So I'll show you. So this is the initial configuration of the chain. It's a 4-1 knot, for instance. This is a zero unknotted chain. And let's see if it works. Yes. So this is the kind of uh, dynamics that you get when you solve this equation. Uh, OK, I'm sorry. It's going a little bit down. So you can choose any time you want. You can choose the initial final configuration. You can choose the bending rigidity, the Kuhn length, uh, the time, etc. OK. This was a chain of 240 monomer, etc. And as I said, you, uh, if you want to do statistics on the possibilities and on the knotting and knotting, you should do simulations with many initial conditions and uh, with many noise realizations. So let me show you some results. So for instance, uh, this is uh, initial state is a 5-1 knot. And uh, you look at the unknotting of a of a 5-1 knot. So in most cases, uh, in many cases at least, the 5-1 goes through, so this is the most interesting um, graph. So this is the 5-1, and this is the time as a function of time. So this is the unknot state of the, of the chain. So for instance, to go from 5-1 to 0-1, First, the system goes to 5-2, then to 3-1, then to 0. And uh, the interesting thing is that the system could go directly from 5-1 to 3-1 to 0-1, but it doesn't do it. It goes uh, through the 5-2 in many cases. So some other interesting uh, cases are 5-1 to unknot. Uh, these are cases where the, the unknotting goes directly uh, through 3-1 without going through 3-2. And you see that the incidence of the persistence length, so this is persistence length 50, persistence length 150. The incidence is not very important. So this is the number of crossings. This is the right. And uh, yeah, OK. Sorry? Yeah, well. Yeah, yes, quite, yes. A factor of, uh, almost a factor of, yeah, 50% or something like that. Uh, yes, yes, indeed. Uh, another interesting, uh, okay, let me continue. Yes, those, this is 5-2 to a knot and a knot to 5-2. So 5-2 to a knot, so you go from 5-2, 3-1, a knot. And if you do the reverse, stochastically, you have a knot, 
3152. Uh, this is the RMSD to the initial condition or to the final condition. And you see that you have some kind of uh, stochastic reversibility when you go from 52 to a knot or a knot to 52. The interesting, so we are, the, this is ongoing work with uh, Christian. It's not yet published. Uh, it's almost uh, published, hopefully. Uh, the interesting uh, things are that 5.1 sometimes goes through 5.2. Usually it goes through 3.1, but it could go directly to 0.1. But it doesn't. And the lifetime of 5.1 is a few times longer than that of 5.2. And this is uh, a little bit uh, contrary, contrary to, the, to the fact that the incidence of 5.2 is double that of 5.1. So which means that the incidence of not is not necessarily related to their lifetime. It's, is it two? Oh, it's five two, yes. Five two, yes, okay, sorry. Yes, yes, of course, yes, I'm sorry. Yes. Okay, I will not dis, uh, how much time do I have? Okay, 10 minutes, so. Okay, maybe, so maybe I will stop with, uh, with this and I will skip the, um, what to do when there is uh, self-interaction or self, I, I, I will go, I will conclude this part and I, I just want to say a few words about RNA knots. So to conclude this part, uh, it's possible to study within this uh, simple model the exact transition path between various knotted conformations. Uh, so these paths are paths which, uh, you, which gen you generate the path to entangle or disentangle in presence of topoisomerase. It's possible to, to study several entangled paths and see how they separate, how they entangle or disentangle. Uh, of course, the model for semi-flexible chain is a bit uh, primitive model in the sense that uh, the bond length is not fixed, but it's fixed on the average. And uh, the question uh, of what happens, you can ask the question for open chains, how to unknot them in absence of topoisomerase or with topoisomerase, which is not 100% uh, efficient. And therefore, uh, this is the case when you deal with really self-avoiding walks. Okay, so this is ongoing work, and uh, for this part, I will stop here. And now I'll go to uh, the more general, uh, to another problem that we have been studying with Christian and uh, Marco Di Stefano, which is the, the problem of the existence of knots in RNA. So I've been working quite a lot on RNA in recent years, and so we know that there is a lot of knots in DNA, we showed, uh, we saw some examples before. These are all the knots in the uh, electrophoretic bands that are obtained. We had also done a, a study with Christian about knotted proteins, and we found that uh, about 2% uh, about of all the PDB proteins are knotted. So in polymer theory, we know that the probability of a knot decays exponentially with the size of the chain. There is a theorem which uh, shows that uh, exactly mathematically. Uh, in, in physics, it was uh, inferred since a long time uh, that the probability of a knot decays exponentially with size. So as a result, in double-stranded DNA, there are very frequent, uh, very many knots. 2% of all the PDB proteins typically uh, have knots, and the most uh, complex knot is a six knot. And then the question, the natural question is, what about RNA? Are there knots in RNA or not? Not NOT, of course. So what we did is we extracted from the PDB all the RNA chains, hybridized, not hybridized. And if you take all the fragments, these correspond to 7,000, 
about 7,000 distinct RNA fragments. Each chain is circularized using the minimally invasive scheme and they compute the Alexander polynomial Docker code in order to detect what are the, no, what are the nodes present in the RNA. So this was work, as I said, For all questions, I will ask my lawyer. <laughs> so, okay, Christian, why do you? Does this satisfy you? <laughs> yes, I have my not expert. <laughs> okay, so the result is the following. There are only three knotted structures among the 7,000 structures uh, which are obtained. I will show them a little bit uh, in more detail. So there is a 16 crossing prime knot in, in this uh, RNA, which is uh, comprised of 3,000 170 bases. There is a, a figure of eight knot in, a, in, this, uh, in this RNA and another figure of eight and three trifoil knots in this RNA. Uh, all the knots which were found in RNA will found, were found in cryo-EM structures. I have nothing against cryo-EM. It's a great... Uh, Okay, it's a great method. So this is, for instance, uh, this uh, protein, 2GYA0, and this is the trefoil knot that was obtained. Now, it turns out that uh, this knot, uh, for this protein, there is an X-ray, uh, there is an X-ray resolution, and this X-ray resolution doesn't show this knot. So this is the place where the knotting takes place, and this, in the X-ray, there is no knot. So first example. Second example is this one. Again, this is, uh, in this case, this is one of the knots. So in this cryo-EM, these two structures are obtained by cryo-EM. So in this one, there is a knot, but in the corresponding X-ray structure, no knot. And finally, the third one, the third one, it, there is no X-ray uh, structure for this RNA, and therefore, we cannot be very conclusive. So, the one thing that I want to emphasize is that all these structures are obtained from cryo-EM. There is probably an error in the structure of 3JYX5. When I write there is probably, it's because the authors themselves question the resolution in the region where there is uh, the knot. They are not very sure about that. Uh, 2JYA0, so these two uh, RNAs may have uh, a genuine knot, but again, it could be an artifact of cryo-EM. And as we saw, there are very few clo very close homologues of these uh, structures which have no knots. So the conclusion, the present conclusions, is that there are knots are very rare in RNA and possibly non-existent. However, uh, some knots were designed uh, in the late uh, 90 or yes, or mid 90, 95, 96 by uh, Simon and his group. So, um, and uh, the idea is that if you can, it's quite easy to make a, a twist knot because essentially this, when you have a pairing of bases in RNA, it makes a helix. So if you have a loop at the end, if you can thread uh, one of the ends here through the loop, you have a nice twist knot. And um, these people 
produced uh, synthetic RNA, which had this property, and, uh, and um, they even showed that there is uh, one topoisomerase which can reduce the knot and, and uh, unknot this knot. So we have also come out with some ideas about how to, I'm almost done, I'll be done before, <laughs> how to design RNA knots. And one of the simplest way to do is to take uh, some so-called, if you construct a H pseudonaut, so the H pseudonaut in RNA is a structure which is like this. Yes? Yes, so this is an H pseudonaut. So what you have here is a helix, and uh, you have a helical part like this. And then uh, in this part, you have also, this is also helical. Now, uh, RNA helix takes 10.7 bases to make one turn. So if this is long enough, if this helix is long enough, there is a, a possibility to thread, because it's turning, it's making one turn or more, there is a possibility to thread this through this and make it a genuine knot. So, of course, the kind of uh, knot, whether you make a knot or not, the representation, the secondary structure representation doesn't see the existence of a knot. It's completely standard like this. But if you look in the, in the PDB file, uh, there is a certain number of, uh, of RNAs which have uh, both helices long enough so that by uh, doing some simple engineering on the second helix, it would be possible probably to thread it through and make knots. Okay, so conclusion uh, for the RNA. Uh, the question is, are there any RNA knots in RNA? And the solution, probably not. And to end, I'll show this picture, which was drawn by Francesca Micheletti, who is uh, Christian's daughter. Uh, so this is not an RNA, because it has a knot. And uh, it's inspired by uh, a painting by Magritte, which is called, This is not a pipe. And thank you very much for your